Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Council of Trent podcast. I'm your host, Catholic Answers apologist and speaker, Trent Horn. In today's episode, I want to piggyback a little bit on a subject that I raised in the previous episode. So yesterday I talked about how kindness is a necessary condition for evangelization, but it's not sufficient. Kindness, charity, holiness, works of mercy— We absolutely need to be doing these things. If we're not doing them and all we have are arguments, all we have are persuasive defenses of Catholicism, it's not going to be—it's not going to reach people. Uh, St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, I have all knowledge, but if I'm puffed up, if I do not have love, then I'm like a resounding gong. So kindness is necessary, but it is not sufficient. Uh, In some particular cases— in some cases, uh, there will be interactions where the the holiness of an individual will, will bring about radical conversion in others, uh, especially for people who, who need more of a spiritual kick in the pants, if you will. But there are many people, and that's what I want to talk about today, many people who are not Catholic or they are no longer Catholic in the sense that they no longer practice their faith, they no longer identify as being Catholic— because they disagree with the teachings of the church. So kindness uh, and relational uh, evangelism, if you will, as I said, that is necessary, not always going to be sufficient. We have to engage people and realize that a lot of the reasons that people are not Catholic is because they disagree with the faith. And I think today will be helpful because I want to go through uh, three different surveys that talk about the demographics and the reasons behind people leaving the church. Because you'll hear people say, you know, why why do people leave the Catholic faith? Uh, And some people say, oh, it's just obvious it's the sex abuse scandal. Um, And that's not the case. There are some people for whom that is why they're no longer Catholic. But by and large, that is not the, that's not the majority view. So I I think it's always helpful to go to the the data or data, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Is it data or is it data? Uh, data is a character on uh, on Star Trek, so maybe I should say data, to go to the results of surveys to find out the answers to these questions. So I want to talk to you about three of them. One is the 2009 Pew Forum survey. The other is, uh, what was it, the publication uh, for religion, PRRI, Population Religion Research Institute. I can't remember. It's PRRI survey. That was done back in 2016. Both of those are summarized on an article here I'll link to in the description below at Brandon Vaught's website. Brandon is the publishing director for Word on Fire. So he works at Bishop Barron. Uh, He also has uh, Claritas University. He has a lot of great courses there. Definitely check him out, Brandon Vaught, brandonvogt.com. So this is an article here that does a great summary of the Pew study and then the PRRI survey. Then after that, I want to talk about a survey that was commissioned by The Pillar. The Pillar is a Catholic news uh, blog slash magazine. I'm not quite sure how to how to describe it, but The Pillar is very good. They have a lot of good coverage on uh, the church and the news. It's run by J.D. I think J.D. Flynn and Ed Condon. I know it's run by J.D. Flynn. J.D. used to be with the Catholic News Agency. Now he does The Pillar. I really like J.D. a lot. I'd love to have him on the show here at some point to talk about how Catholics can distinguish real news from fake news and all these kinds of things. So the article says, uh, new stats on why young people leave the church. Uh, So Brandon says, in my book, Return, How to Draw Your Child Back to the Church, a book I actually endorse. It's a very good book. People always ask me, how do I get my son or daughter to come back to the church? And what's hard is, I've never met this person, so I don't quite know how to do that. I know how to give answers for arguments they might have, but return, how to draw your child back to the church, that's a really good book Brandon did that covers a lot of this. Uh, So it says, a new survey uh, released by PRRI uh, entitled uh, Exodus, Why Americans Are Leaving Religion and Why They're Unlikely to Come Back is based on a survey conducted in August of 2016 with about 2,200 adults. So Brandon includes the results from that survey, as well as from the Pew Forums. Uh, Pew does all kinds of surveys, and Pew did a a survey of about 30,000 Americans. So it, um, it says here that both surveys reinforce the same dire picture as previous studies. Young people are leaving religion in droves, and the so-called nuns, N-O-N-E-S, 
are on the rise. People who identify with any religion. Uh, below Brandon, uh, he puts forward kind of the uh, an executive summary, if you will, of both surveys. I think the first part deals with uh, PRI and what they say. So here's some of the stats on the demographics where we're at. First, 10% of American adults are former Catholics. I mean, that's amazing that if you walk down the street, I mean, it's going to be different in different areas, obviously, but on average, one out of every 10 people used to be Catholic. One out of every 10 people, right? And you always, this is probably common for you. You talk to people, oh yeah, I grew up Catholic. Oh yeah, I went to Catholic school. As their way of saying that they know the lingo, they've been there, been there, done that, but they're not Catholic anymore. So where do they go? Uh, when Catholics leave the church, they become, when they leave, nearly half of them are unaffiliated. So I wonder if this survey had been done back in the 80s and 90s, because there was also a bit of a concern about an exodus from the Catholic Church in the 80s and 90s. That's what motivated Scott Hahn, Pat Madrid, Tim Staples, Jimmy Aiken, Carl Keating to do Catholic apologetics, because in the 80s especially, 80s and 90s, you had, when Catholics would leave the faith, I think predominantly they were going to other Protestant denominations, usually evangelical Protestants. So it says here, about one in four do go to evangelical Protestantism, about one in four, but nearly half, 49%, are unaffiliated or they just have no religion at all. If they leave Catholicism, they apostatize. They they completely leave the Christian faith. About 13% join more of the mainline Protestant denominations, and another 13% are other, they probably join another world religion, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, they become Jewish, Muslim, but it's but the the unaffiliated or nuns n o n e s is is growing a lot. So it says that twenty five percent of Americans identify today as nuns, highest percentage ever recorded. Uh, the nuns are now the single largest religious group in America. So uh, if you look at if you call the nuns a denomination, they would be the um, the largest group. It said twenty one percent of the nuns were raised unaffiliated while 28% of them were actually raised Catholic. So uh, when you look at age brackets, uh, age brackets today among the nuns, 39% of young adults identify as nun. Uh, so when you look at just, I guess, young adults today, ages 18 to 29. Uh, so I guess now, this was in 2016, so five years ago. <clears throat> that would have been the tail end of millennials, but definitely we call this Gen Z, Zoomers, if you will. Uh, it says among them, 39% are nuns, 15% are Catholic, 9% white evangelical Protestant, uh, 8% mainline Protestant, 7% black Protestant, and then other other Protestants, and 7% belong to a non-Christian religion. So another thing I find interesting both in Pew and PRRI is when people leave. When do people leave the Catholic faith? And typically it is early. Uh, it is while they're still at home. That's why when we get to the report from The Pillar by J.D. Flynn, when it talks about the domestic church, you'll see why this is so important, why it is so important. And I take this as with a heavy heart and a big saddle on my shoulders. Do you wear a saddle on your shoulders? I wear a saddle on a horse's shoulders, <laughs> a burden upon my shoulders that I have three kids, no guarantee. I pray for them. I pray for their souls, for their faith. But the faith can it slip away. You need the parents that try, they they do the, the the absolute best they can. There's no guarantee, too. Kids have free will. They have free will they can choose. You can do so if you're a parent and your kid has left the faith, I mean, don't you don't have to necessarily don't beat yourself up upon it about it. And also it, it may not be, you know, directly a result of your influence. And I think if you've been derelict in your duties, you're not taking you're not going to mass at all, showing up on Christmas and Easter, talk about the faith disparagingly. If the faith is something that is a source of a burden and it's not an authentic joy for you, just like I have to make sure work, faith does not become a job. It's hard for me. My faith, my, my, my job is to defend the Catholic faith. So it's a really blurred line between my faith and my job. And all of us sometimes get a little disdain about our jobs. I don't want to have that bleed over from my work, which I love. I got the best job in the world. I get to help people learn about Jesus. That's great. But still, work is work. You know, and, and I don't, I would be so remiss if my, if I treated the faith like a job and my kids saw it that way, 
And they decided that is not, that's not a position they want to sign up for. So it happens early. According to the Pew Forum, 79% of former Catholics leave the church before the age of 23. According to PRRI, 90% of the nuns, those who just have no religion whatsoever, left before the age of 29. Here's where it gets shocking for me. Uh, almost two-thirds of them, almost two-thirds of them leave before the age of 18. So if you have a religious kid, if you got a kid who's religious, let's say seven or eight, you know, let's say you start with a sample group, 100% of them are religious at the age of eight, okay? Two-thirds of that group of elementary school students, two-thirds of them uh, who, who do leave, uh, will leave before the age of 18. So it's not like two-thirds are going to leave. I'm saying is, of those in that group who will leave, two-thirds of them will leave before they get out of high school. So what do we do? Well, I'll tell you one thing we don't do. We cannot... There's a key moment, I think. And I've got little kids right now. Soon they're going to be treading into young adult... Not soon. It feels soon at home. But there's a point where we have to not treat kids like kids. We should always respect their innocence. But I think kids are capable at 8, 9, 10 years old of asking really hard questions. Go to Catholic Answers Live. The uh, Catholic Answers Live, our radio show, catholic.com. We do kid Q&A. And kids call in with their parents' permission, and they ask really good questions. And so if we don't respond to them, if we treat... You cannot educate a high school student in this... Or a junior high student, even. You don't educate a junior high student in the same way you educate a five-year-old. You, you can't. For a five- or six-year-old doing Sunday school where we're just telling really good stories and instilling virtue, that's great. But if you treat all youth formation like it's just extended Sunday school, and all we have to do is teach them about the faith and that's enough, that is not enough. That is not enough. We have to teach them not only about the faith, but why the faith is true why it is true, good, and beautiful, and why it is superior to every other alternative, and that it's not a bad thing to say that. We should not act superior, you know, hoity-toity, prideful, but the faith is superior because it is true. Now, Second Vatican Council, we don't deny what is holy and true in other religions, but we see where the fullness of the truth is. And so young people— they need to know that. And honestly, they should be exposed. They should know about all these other religions, all these other belief systems, know about them, what's good in them, but also what is lacking in them, what is missing, and why our faith is different. And then to authentically live it out, which I'll get to here at the at the end of the episode. Let's go down to why they are leaving. Uh, this is a good summary here, and it covers uh, PRI, the 2016 survey with 2,000 adults, and Pew but they, they get similar results. So PRRI, about 2,000 adults in 2016. The most common reason why uh, they left religion in general, why people are nuns and they're not religious at all, 60% said, I stopped believing in the religion's teachings. Now, that could just be lackadaisical. That could be apathetic, like they just stopped believing for no good reason. Like, I just don't think it's true anymore. Or I don't think it's relevant or important. And they gradually drift away, or they actively oppose it. But it's very clear for 60% of them, um, I just, I don't believe in it anymore, or I think that it's it's false. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that it's true. 32%, my family was never that religious growing up, so they weren't really instilled with it. Maybe they were nominally religious growing up, but then once they're an adult, just it's easy to shed that if it was never really instilled. This is interesting, 29%. Negative religious teachings about or treatment of gay and lesbian people, 29%. Uh, that's 39% for millennials as to why they've left religion. And for those who are raised Catholic, 39% of them who leave, um, they say it's because of this. Now, this, is, this statement is ambiguous. Negative religious teachings about or treatment of gay and lesbian people. Go back to the episode yesterday, right? Uh, this could mean that they saw Catholics uh, who were mean, who used slurs, who engaged in negative and unfair stereotypes, uh, who were uncharitable and did not express the love of Christ to people who identify as LGBT. So that could be treatment of. That could be what they mean. And if that's the reason, 
That's incredibly unfortunate because that's not what God calls us to do. But I find many times what they mean here, negative religious teachings or treatment of means the Bible saying sexual relations between two men or two women is sinful. The church saying marriage is the union of a man and a woman. The church not marrying two men or two women. That that is what they mean by negative religious teachings or treatment. And so there there just is no amount of accompaniment, dialogue, uh, you know, just, and, and those things aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves. There's no amount of, we can be really kind and gentle and warm and loving that will get around the fact that they'll say, I just disagree with the teaching. I stop believing this teaching. I don't think it's true. That I think for many young people that this, the teaching about homosexuality for them, asking them to believe it, that, that they are as convinced that homosexuality is moral or celebratory, they are as convinced as they believe in the theory of evolution, or even like that the earth is round. Like telling many young people today, to be Catholic, you must believe that homosexual behavior is immoral. Many of them, that would be like telling them you have to believe that the earth is round. I mean, that you have to believe the earth is flat. It, that it's just, they have been ingrained in it so much in our society. They, they literally have just been brainwashed. So much so... I was reading another article that said 40% of Gen Z identifies as LGBTQ. They identify as one of those things, even though throughout most of the 20th century, when we have done reliable surveys, people who identify as LGBT is usually somewhere between one and 2%. And somewhere it's like 40% of Gen Zers identify because it's, it's hip, it's cool. For many, many of these people, when they see in, in Hollywood, when they see among YouTube personalities, it is a, this is a heavy hurdle that we are going to have to address. And I think the only way we can really address it is to present to them a logical, emotionally fulfilling, consistent view of sexuality, that you cannot understand the church's teachings on homo- homosexuality unless you understand its teaching on sexuality in general. So I don't believe it's hopeless because I think a lot of people are are sexually broken, wounded, and they see what the culture is offering on sex on sex and sexuality is a, a bag of lies, it's a it's a faulty bill of goods that leads to emptiness or despair in many cases. Uh not everyone's going to say they're in despair following it, but I think that the church's teachings when lived out in a faithful, joyful and consistent way that's something that's beautiful. I don't know anybody. I don't know anyone, religious, non-religious, atheist. I don't know any hardened atheist who would sneer at an 85-year-old couple that has been married for 60 years and is still happy and hold hands and feeds the ducks at the park. I, I don't know anybody. You know anyone like, look at those losers. They're not going to think that. Many of them, they might feel a, a sense of envy or disdain that these people have a an enduring sense of happiness and fidelity that this world this world doesn't offer because it values autonomy and pleasure more uh than faithful sacrificial love so i do think this is a big one and the pri survey it shows up a lot 29 percent we're going to have to confront this uh with people and we have to confront those who say the teaching is false to give them good reasons to think that the um that the teaching is true 19% said the clergy uh, sex abuse scandal. So what's interesting is that, uh, and I've read other ones actually that placed it uh, a lot lower. Uh, Other surveys have put it more around like 10%. So this is a bit higher than I thought, but it's still, it's 19%. It's not the majority. It's not the case. So even if you average it out, four out of five people who leave religion, it's not because of, um, it's not because of clergy abuse or, or something like that. Though it's interesting that the clergy abuse scandal is... Uh, more of a factor for women leaving than for men leaving. So um, it could be the case that women are more likely to be victims of things like sexual abuse than men. So maybe they more identify with the harms that are involved there. I don't know. It's just you could speculate on that. And then finally rounding it out as a traumatic event in my life. And my church or congregation became too focused on politics. Now, this could be a fault. You know, you don't, you know, Put not your trust in princes. I think that's Psalm 146 says that. But sometimes they call it politics when it's just the church is saying we should not make it legal to kill babies in the womb. 
and marriage is a union of a man and a woman. And they say that's too political. A lot of these same people who say it's too focused on politics don't mind when the church endorses their politics, like the church promotes certain views on immigration or health care or racism or things like that. Usually it's came involved in politics I disagree with. Uh, the Pew survey in 2009 uh, reached a lot of similar things. Uh, I gra- 71% gradually drifted away. 65% stopped believing in the religion's teachings. So still pretty similar. Though we see more 43% spiritual needs not being met. Uh, 29% unhappy with teachings about the Bible. Oh, and this one, Faith in Flux, this is about Catholics who left. So this group, spiritual needs and teachings about the Bible, this would be the people who probably leave to become Protestant who a lot of times go to a more a worship service they might consider more charismatic, I guess, or uh, something within the evangelical uh, sphere of worship that they enjoy more. They like more of an in-depth study of the Bible, which, of course, you can have in Catholicism. We need to, to help people with that. And we still see that here, dissatisfaction with atmosphere at worship services. You hear that all the time, right? Uh, I didn't get anything out of the Mass. And what's hard is, well, you might not, because when you worship liturgy, comes from the Greek word liturgos, which means the work of the people. So, you know, I didn't get anything out of Mass. I don't mean to be cruel or crude, but what we get out of Mass is what we put into it. It's like if you went to the gym, and I've done this, you go to the gym, and you walk on the treadmill, like at 1.0 speed, like, you know, the treadmill has a speed, right? And you go ramp it up or down. How many of you have set the speed to 1.5 and just watch the Food Network? so cruel. Why do you got to play the Food Network? Or I go there to watch cable news because I don't have news and I'm just kind of waltzing along. And then I eventually quit the gym because I'm like, well, you know, why don't you go to the gym anymore? I just didn't really get anything out of it. Well, what did you put into it? <laughs> you know, If you just went there and did the absolute bare minimum, of course, you're not going to get anything out of it. Similar with mass, with the divine liturgy. We will only get out of it what we spiritually put into it. And we have to understand what we're doing. If we don't understand the liturgy, we can't do the work of the liturgy. Uh, as uh, we are a royal priesthood, you know, as uh, the first letters of St. Peter says. Finally, dissatisfaction with clergy at the congregation and found a religion they liked uh, more. Also talks about uh, the Diocese of Springfield didn't exit survey. Uh, Still pretty um, similar things there. All right, let me go to the pillar. This one came out, I want to say it was like a month or two ago. It was 2021. And it talked about what are the habits that show people who are more likely to remain Catholic and especially more likely to be weekly mass goers. Because there's a lot of people who will stay Catholic, but they show up at Christmas and Easter and that's it. And they don't believe Christ is present in the Eucharist and they use contraception and they see nothing wrong with um, homosexuality, homosexual behavior. So, you know, it's, it's still falling really, really short. So, um, the pillar did this survey that was conducted uh, at the end of sep- between September 28th, October 25th of a variety of Catholics and talks about them and retention, staying Catholic. So it compares here taking a child to mass. So if you take them less, uh, not weekly, less than weekly as a child, when they grow up to be an adult, about 68% of them will still be Catholic, uh, but only 12% of them will go weekly. So that makes sense, right? If you didn't go weekly as a kid, you're not going to go weekly as an adult. Uh, If you take a child to Mass weekly, if you take them weekly, a higher percentage will be Catholic. Um, Not necessarily, uh, well, let's see, what is this, uh, 60, 74%. So about 6% more will be Catholic in general, but it's kind of split. Three times likely to go to Mass weekly if you um, went to Mass weekly as a child. Uh, so this is, uh, Im- so that's, that's always, uh, very helpful weekly, especially daily if you can. Uh, but definitely weekly, obviously is our Sunday obligation. Grace before meals. This is an interesting one. Once again, we don't see a huge difference between staying Catholic or not, but if you never, so if you never said grace before meals, uh, those, you know, that group about, uh, 67%, two thirds stay Catholic, I get a little higher once again, about 74%, similar to the previous one. Uh, stay Catholic, but you're five times more likely, 43%, five times more likely to go to Mass weekly if your family just said grace before meals daily. A very simple thing uh, to do. Always really nice thing to do. And it's great because it's a short prayer. Kids can lead it. That's always um, that's always really nice. 
In fact, the Pillar survey said there was a clear, uh, it showed a clear correlation between childhood practice and regular mass attendance later in life. It said these five things uh, show a clear correlation. Reading the Bible, volunteering, like a soup kitchen, prison ministry, church work, pregnancy center, uh, those kinds of things, praying the rosary, going to confession, and Eucharistic adoration. I'll read them again. So five things that are correlated with uh, regular mass attendance later in life. As a child, if you live out your faith, so reading the Bible, volunteering, praying the rosary, going to confession, Eucharistic adoration. This does not mean this is a surefire silver bullet, your kid will stay Catholic. Gives them a lot better opportunity, though. Gives them uh, a lot better chance. It says, people who reported that their childhood families have participated every month in all five practices had an 82% chance of remaining Catholic and a 58% chance of going to Mass weekly later in life. Here's interesting. Among those who said they participated in none of these activities as children, 69% still say they're Catholic. So it's interesting, 82% remain Catholic, 69%, they they never volunteer, no rosary, never went to adoration, no confession, but only 10% of them attend Mass weekly versus 58% who do all five. But what's interesting here is that even if you do one, even if you do one thing, or two things, 24 to 25% are more likely uh, to go to Mass weekly. It's about two to three times as many just by adding one or two things. Um, So that's helpful. And uh, as I, oh, and this here actually, um, Catholic retention rate uh, based on parents accompanying children to Mass. This is interesting because we always hear like, oh, it's always a father, it's always a father. Fathers are very important, very, very important. Really though, this particular survey by the Pillar uh, it's both. Uh, if neither parent went to Mass, uh, they might still go to Mass. 63% of those who went as a kid who didn't go with a parent, maybe they went with a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle, were still Catholic, but only thir- 13% of them went to Mass uh, weekly as an adult. If it's just mother or father only, about 26% weekly Mass going. Uh, but then it goes up the highest when your mother and your father go. And we see something similar um Catholic retention rate, when you ask, what is your biggest influence? If it's, um, if your mother and father are your biggest influence, you're the most likely to go to Mass weekly. If uh, things you read on the internet is your biggest influence, that's the least likely. So it's about staying that influence with your children. And that's why it's important, though, to walk the fine line to not be a harsh authoritarian and not be a permissible person that just doesn't really care. And I'm always trying to walk that line. Usually I'm permissible, and then I realize I've been too permissive. I snap into authoritarian and overreact. It's like trying to find the the pendulum swing. You know, get it get it just right. So it's about being authoritative without being authoritarian. Okay. And and the biggest thing there is just the joy. Finding, and I would encourage you, find the community, find the liturgy that brings you joy. Your your children will sense if you're faking it. They will sense that. If you need to go to another parish, if your parish is just banal, if it's just, ugh, you cringe every time you go, go try another try another parish. If it's not spiritually working for you, I know people have some views on this. Your family comes, your family comes first. We got to stay and fix our parish. That's not your job. Your job is not to fix, uh, you cannot fix the whole church. Your job, if you're a mother or father, you have a domestic church at home. You have a domestic church. In the Eastern Rite, in the Byzantine church, you receive a crown. You get it's called the sacrament of matrimony is called the mystery of crowning. You get a crown. The priest places a crown on you uh, because you are the 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 hierarchs, if you will, of the domestic church in your home. You're like the the, the king and queen bishop of your your home, if you will. It is uh, uh, it's so important. So find that. Maybe it's another. Uh, parish in the Latin rite that, that does Novus Ordo rite. Maybe it's Anglican Ordinariate. Maybe it's a, a Latin mass. If you happen to have one still near you, uh, if you have a divine liturgy, who knows what it might be. Or at the very least, even if the parish is okay, join a group or community that does praise and worship, for example, not to replace the liturgy, but to supplement it, like during a weeknight, a Bible study, a rosary. Find the thing in the faith that brings you joy and let your children see that joy. And hey, I'm, all, I'm always still trying to work on it. I'm not perfect. Sometimes I just don't feel very joyful. 
but I'm trying. Uh, you know, do the you do the best you're there, but for the grace of God, go I. So pray for me. I'll say a little prayer for you all. I hope this is helpful for everybody. I'll leave links to these articles in the description below. And yeah, I just hope you have a very blessed day. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you want to help us produce more great content like this, be sure to click subscribe and go to trenthornpodcast.com to become a premium subscriber. You'll help us create more videos like this and get access to bonus content and sneak peeks of our upcoming projects.